I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praises shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord, and the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt God's name together. Welcome to Trinity United Church of Christ. We have curated an amazing worship service today just for you this on the Lord's day. So come on and let's go to worship and exalt the Lord together. of the Lord is here. The presence of the Lord is here. I feel it in the atmosphere. The presence of the Lord is here. The presence of the Lord is here. The power of the Lord is here. The power of the Lord is here. I feel it in the atmosphere. Yeah. The power of the Lord here. The power of the Lord is here. The Spirit of the Lord is here. The Spirit of the Lord is here. I feel it in the atmosphere, yeah. The Spirit of the Lord is here. The Spirit of the Lord is here. You have to believe. Everybody blow the trumpet and sound the alarm. Because the Lord is in his temple, let everybody bow. Let all the people praise him now, the Lord. I say it again. The Lord Almighty, the Lord. presence of the Lord and I'm gonna get my blessings right now I can feel the presence of the Lord and I'm gonna get my blessings right now I can feel the spirit of the Lord and I'm gonna get my blessings right now I can feel the healing of the Lord and I'm gonna get my healing right now I can feel he's in the room I'm gonna get my blessings right now He's in the room, and I'm going to get my blessings right now. I can feel the power in the room. I'm going to get my blessing. Hey, my blessing. My healing. My deliverance. Oh, the presence of the Lord is here. Can't you feel his presence? Can't you feel his peace and his power? If you feel his presence today, church, then wherever you are, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All ye land, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is God who has made us and not we ourselves. We are God's people and the sheep of his pasture. So enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Enter unto his courts with praise. Be thankful unto God and bless God's name for the Lord 
is good. Has the Lord been good to you today? Has the Lord blessed you? Has the Lord made a way where there is no way? If God has blessed you, then you ought to bless God back. Put those blessed hands together. Open up your mouth and shout unto God with the mighty voice of triumph. For God is great and greatly to be praised. He's worthy to be praised from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Our God is worthy to be praised. So let everything, let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. Almighty and most merciful God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Now let the words of our mouth the meditations of our heart, may they be found acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our most blessed Redeemer. Now let us pray together the prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray when they asked him, Master, teach us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Children are future, teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a sense of pride to make it easier. Let the children's
We thank and praise God today for the greatest love of all of our God. Our God's love is so unconditional toward us. It's steadfast toward us. And the God's love keeps us morning by morning and day by day. We thank and praise God today for that um, the amazing music of our music ministry on this day. We just have a few announcements for you on this Sunday. Number one, we just want to continue to thank you for your continued prayers and support of our senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III, as he is on sabbatical. I bet you're asking how he's doing. He is doing great as he's getting a lot of rest. He's being revived and restored during this time. And we just ask that you will continue to make sure that you pray for him. Don't text him, don't email him. Lest none of us, we don't want to bother him as we ensure that he gets the rest that he needs during this season so that when he returns to us, he will be the better because of it and ready to serve God's people. Additionally, as you know, we're just a couple days away from, away from voting. Um, this particular Tuesday is a critical day as it is election day. If you have not voted, we ask that you get yourself out and take the time to vote. Vote because vote like our lives depend on it because our lives do depend on it. This voting season, this election is so critical as it will impact not just today, uh, the current generation, but it will impact generations to come. So we ask that when you get out and vote, that you take the time to get a selfie with your sticker and send it on in as our pastor has asked so that we can share it with the congregation and with the world, that our people, our Trinity family, and those who watch us have been out to vote. Finally, we want to ask that you take the time to continue to practice social distancing and your PPE, making sure that you wear your mask. I'm not sure if you heard this week, our governor as well as our mayor had announced that our COVID cases have, are on the rise. Uh, this week, we had the greatest death toll since June 17th, um, since this pandemic. And so we want to make sure that we are continuing to keep our guard up, that we are wearing our masks that we're socialing, social distancing and that we are being safe and we want to make sure that you're being safe and that you're remaining healthy. So we know that the holidays are coming and one of the uh, reasons why uh, COVID cases are on the rise is because so many people are still gathering, removing their mask and uh, letting their guard down. So let's make sure that we keep our guard up, we wear our mask and we take care of ourselves during this season. Those end our announcements and we say may God bless you and may God smile upon you. And we've now come to the time in our service where we worship with our tithes and our offerings. Let's hear our announcement now. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure pressed down and running over. Shall the Lord give into your lap. We, the Village of Trinity, are committed to lifting up Christ, engaging our community, and celebrating our culture. Today, your gifts of tithes and offering will allow the work of Trinity to continue as we seek to provide ministry and resources to those who are incarcerated, ill, hungry, hurting, and whose backs are against the walls. There are multiple ways for you to support the ministry of Trinity with your tithes and offerings. You may give through our Secure Give application. You may also text to give by dialing 855-781-8384. You can also use our cash app, dollar sign, Trinity UCC, or use our website. With a few easy clicks, you will be well on your way to support this ministry. Also, our First Fruits Direct Draft Program allows you to make your church a priority. And if you prefer to mail your gift, simply send your tithe or donation to 400 West, 95th Street. Thank you for supporting Trinity United Church of Christ the greatest church this side of the Jordan. God's people, we've come to that point in our service where we take the time to remember the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through the service of Holy Communion. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, in observance of the Passover, he took the bread and after he had given thanks, he broke it and said to the disciples, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this and eat this in remembrance of me. Likewise, in the same manner, after the supper, he took the cup and said, this is the cup 
and a new covenant in my blood. Likewise, whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And so God's people, we come today in obedience of that commandment to remember him in the service of Holy Communion. But before we take part in the elements, we take the time to confess publicly as a congregation, as we confess our sins. And so we invite you wherever you are, if you are able to please stand, as we publicly confess our sins before God. Almighty and merciful Father, we come before you acknowledging our sins, our shortcomings, and our breaking of our covenant with you. Not only have we done things we ought not to have done, said things we ought not to have said, left undone so many things we ought to have done and been silent when we should have witnessed for you. Not only are we guilty of that, O oh Lord, but we have also closed our eyes and pretended not to see the injustices, the racism, and the evil which pervade our everyday lives. We have shut our ears and pretended not to hear the cries for liberation, which come from the lips, the lives, and the hearts of the oppressed, even our own black brothers and sisters. Forgive us, O oh Lord, renew our courage and faith, and keep us ever mindful of thy great sacrifice. Hear us, we beseech thee, as we come to you in love and worship, giving your name the praise forevermore, as we say together, amen. God's people, we have now confessed our sins publicly. We have also prayed publicly, but now it is time to take the time to confess our sins privately as we reflect and we think about the assurance of pardon on our lives. Why does God pardon us? Why are we forgiven? Are we forgiven because of the type and size of the homes that we have or the degrees that we have or because of where we live? No, we're not forgiven or because any of that, but we are forgiven and granted pardon because of what Jesus told Nicodemus in John when he said, for God so loved the world that God gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For Christ came into the world, not to condemn the world, but through him all the world might be saved. It's because of the love of Christ Jesus. It's because of God's love for us that we receive pardon and that God has mercy upon us. We invite you now to go to your secret prayer closets and confess your sins as we prepare to go to God in prayer. God have mercy upon us and forgive us of our sins. God have mercy upon us and forgive us of our sins. God, we come individually confessing that we have not been all that you have created us to be. And so now God, if you find anything in us that's unlike you, we ask that you will remove it right now and have mercy upon us. And we ask right now that you would bless these elements. Bless everyone who has prepared, oh God, their Lord's Supper to take right now. We ask that you would bless crackers, that you would bless bread, that you would bless water, juice, or wine. And we ask, oh God, that as we partake of it, that you would not allow it to go down easy, but help us to be reminded of the great sacrifice of your son. For when he sacrificed his life for us, it was not an easy task, but it was a daunting task that he experienced because he loved us. And so God, we thank you now. We thank you for another opportunity to take part in this Holy Communion. And we ask your blessings now upon this service communion. In your son's Jesus name as we pray, let all those who love God say amen. The body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, let us eat together. Also the blood of our Savior Jesus Christ, let us drink together. 
Let us now go to God in prayer. God, we thank you again for another opportunity to remember the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. And we ask, oh God, that as we continue to move forward in this day, let us remember his sacrifice. Let us, oh God, exemplify him in all we say and do so that we might impact change in this community and across this world so that your kingdom here on earth might come into fruition. We ask these things in your son's Jesus name on this day as we say together, amen. Prayer is the soul's sincere desire, uttered or unexpressed, the motion of a hidden fire that trembles in the breast. God's people, we come to that point in our service where we go to God in prayer, and we invite you right now, wherever you are, whether you are in your kitchen, your living room, your den, your, uh, your at work, or in your car, wherever you are, we invite you at this time to stop what you're doing and to center yourselves as we go to the throne of grace. Let us pray. As a deer panteth by the water, God, our soul does thirst for thee. We thirst, O oh God, for your presence. We thirst, O oh God, for your power. We thirst, O oh God, for your love, your grace, and your mercy. God, we thirst for you. And God, we come on this day that you have made we rejoice today because we are so glad in it. We're glad, God, to be in your presence and to be in worship one more time. We're glad, oh God, to honor your name and to magnify your holy name one more time. 
And God, we ask right now that if you find anything in our hearts that's not like you, that God, that you would cast it into the sea of forgiveness. And God, as you cast it into the sea of forgiveness, we thank you today for your mercy upon us. Matter of fact, we thank you, O oh God, for every blessings. We thank you, O oh God, for uh, bringing us over mountains. We thank you, God, for bringing us through valleys. We thank you, O oh God, for every blessing. Matter of fact, God, if we had 10,000 tongues, we'd never be able to thank you enough. So God, if we forgot this morning to say thank you, God, we say thank you right now. And God, I give you thanks for everyone who's watching and listening on this day. And God, I ask that you would bless them with the blessings that they stand in need of. I ask God today that you would meet them at their point of need. God, if they need healing today, I ask that you would heal them. If they need peace, I ask that you would grant them peace. God, whatever it is that they need, God, give it to them right now. God, we ask that you would move on their behalf right now. And God, we also come today asking for continued healing for our nation. We ask, oh God, that you would make the crooked places straight in our nation. We ask, oh God, that for the places where we are divided, that you would unify us. We ask, oh God, in our nation, that you would allow justice to roll down like a mighty river, oh God, on this day. And even, oh God, as we prepare to move toward this election season in these last two days of this election. God, we ask that you would give your people the courage and the strength and allow us to be brave enough to go out and vote. We ask, oh God, that you would give us the strength to vote for the right candidate who will be for your people. God, use us for your service, oh God. Help us to be your trombones in this land. Help us to be your hands and feet, oh God, throughout this world, oh God, so that your people might be blessed, your people might be healed, your people might be fed, your people might have all they need in this earth. And so God, we give you thanks and we give you praise today for all that you will do amongst us, for the many ways that you will bless us, for the many ways, oh God, that you will shift things in our lives, for the many ways, oh God, that you're going to heal, for the many ways that you're going to show up and show out on our behalf. We thank you, God, today, and we give you premature praise for all that you will do. And we ask these things in your precious son Jesus' name today, as we say together, amen. Trinity family, I am so excited to welcome back home to our digital pulpit, our pastor emeritus, no other than the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah A. Wright Jr. I am so excited today because I know every time, as you all know, that our pastor emeritus comes before us, that he brings a mighty word. So we thank and praise God for our pastor emeritus and we ask that you would pray for him as he prepares to provide this word to us on today. And so after the next selection that you hear from our musical department, the next voice that you will hear today will be the voice of no other than our pastor emeritus, the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah A. Wright, Jr.
they fail now Thank you. 
grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from Jesus Christ our Savior. I greet you with the love of the Lord, and I greet you as I have greeted you since September 16th, 2001, with our important words, I love you. If you're not worshiping by yourself virtually, and there's someone else in the room with you, turn to them and say, I love you. That might be the only time this week they hear those words. To pass them off, my beloved brother, to the clergy staff of Trinity Church, to our virtual congregation, and to our congregation waiting for the virus to be over. I thank God for this privilege and I thank Pastor Moss for allowing me the privilege of standing before you on the Sunday before one of the most important presidential elections of the century. Remember to vote this week. Jeremiah the sixth chapter verses thirteen through fifteen are translated by Eugene Peterson into contemporary English as follows. Everyone is after the dishonest dollar. Little people and big people alike. Prophets and priests and everyone in between. Twist words and doctor truth. My people are broken, shattered, and they put on band-aids saying, It's not so bad. You'll be just fine. But things are not just fine. Do you suppose they're embarrassed over this outrage? No, they have no shame. They don't even know how to blush. There is no hope for them. They have hit bottom and there is no getting up. As far as I am concerned, they are finished. God has spoken. In part one of this sermon, we looked at the people of Jerusalem and we looked at the people of Chicago through the lens of Jeremiah 6, verses 13 through 15. And we saw in that sermon how everyone was after the dishonest dollar in Jerusalem and in the United States of America. In biblical days and in our days, there were and there are little people like me and those who worship with us virtually. And there were big people like those who presently occupy the Oval Office at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington. Reverend Dr. Oziel Smith calls it 1600 Transylvania Avenue. Don't forget when you go to the polls on Tuesday that honesty is on the ballot, truth is on the ballot, principles are on the ballot. In the early service this morning, we looked at dishonest towers as a theme for the message. And in looking what we saw that was frightening because of where we are is that big people and little people who are after the dishonest dollar have no equity on their agenda. The word equity is not in their vocabulary. That was number one. They are also people who have no principles. And tragically, they are people who do not pursue justice in any way, form, or fashion. This morning we looked at no equity, no principles, no justice. But those who are called to speak God's word and those who are elected to govern God's people mouth peace when there is no peace. The word of God says where there is no justice, there is no peace. God wants to see justice roll down like waters of a mighty stream. God wants to see justice cascading over the lives and the land of the people who love God and who are trying to live according to God's will. At this service, in the second part of a three-part sermon, I want you to look with me at what God says about crooked clergy. Crooked clergy. 
Remember, these are not Jeremiah the prophet's words. This is what God says to Jeremiah. Verse 15 says clearly, God has spoken. Everyone, God says, everyone is after the dishonest dollar. Everyone is chasing the almighty dollar, the mean green, not only the little people and the big people, but also the clergy, prophets and priests and everyone in between. Prophets are called by God to proclaim the word of God. Priests are called by God to tend the flock of God's sheep. The psalmist says, It is he that has made us, and that we ourselves, we are the sheep of his pasture. That is the priest's job description. But before we look at what God says they're doing, stay with me for just a moment with God's description of the folk he calls everyone in between. Who is in between the priest and the prophet? I'm not sure who they were in Jeremiah's day, six centuries before Jesus was born, but in our day, from what I have seen, the everyone in between, a priest and a prophet, would be the prosperity pimps. Mm -hmm. Self-appointed bishops, kangaroo court anointed apostles, television charlatans, and the folk who care less about the sheep and feeding the sheep because they are too busy fleecing the sheep. They don't speak forth the word of God as prophets do because all they do is speak on behalf of their special anointing. Sow a seed into their ministry and your breakthrough is right around the corner. You've heard them. You've seen them. Quiet as is kept, many of you still support them. I call you those who belong to the virtual congregation of, quote, everyone in between Missionary Baptist Bible Center. Amen. Just send your dishonest dollar to my crooked ministry and your blessing is on the way. Your blessing is on the way. God says the clergy twist words and doctor truth. For a moment I thought everyone in between might be the news, people on Fox Channel. But God says the clergy are doing this. What more graphic description of the clergy in Jeremiah's day and the description of a whole parcel of clergy in our days. Crooks who twist words. Crooks who doctor the truth. If you can't get rid of that cancer it's because you don't believe strong enough, something wrong with your faith, you need to come out of that church and get to another church. Doctoring the truth. During the quarantine caused by coronavirus, I've seen more crooks telling their electronic congregations what the Word of God is saying and what they are saying is nowhere near the truth. They have folks believing that God is either a heavenly slot machine who will send blessings pouring down from heaven if they only keep the praises going up. Let me tell you something. Praise ain't stopped one death from COVID-19. Prayer cloths and holy oil are helpless and powerless against a deadly virus that has caused and continues to cause a global pandemic. And I got news for you. Coronavirus don't care if you're Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Baptist, Baha'i, Protestant or Catholic. One clown who was the leader of the quote everyone in between quote group had militarized police with military garments on clear a path for him at Lafayette Park. Some of you saw it. So he as a clown could walk from the White House to an Anglican church, stand in front of the church, hold the Bible upside down as a symbol of how he twists words, ignores what epidemiologists are saying, 
how he ignores what scientists are saying. I read this week with Kushner. Jared Kushner said to his dad, Donald Trump, take back the country from the scientists. This in between, everyone in between clown, has a flock of fools believing that the pandemic will be over by Easter. Oh, then by July 4th, then by Labor Day, and now with his upside down Bible, tells the Proud Boys to stand back and stand by for what is going to happen on Tuesday, November 3rd. A perfect description of how that high priest of the, quote, everyone in between congregation, end quote, is what my mother used to say about people like him. You talking about doctoring the truth? Trump wouldn't know the truth if you painted his chartreuse, slapped it on an elephant and sat the elephant down in his lap. Trump wouldn't know the truth if it slapped him in the face. His makeup and his hair dye would probably prevent him from feeling the truth, much less recognizing God's truth. Just like Pence couldn't feel the fly, Trump can't feel the truth. God says that God's people are broken. God says that God's people are shattered. God's people have never seen anything like they're seeing in 2020. Not only a global pandemic of a deadly virus for which medical scientists have not yet found a cure. God's people have never seen the raw, ugly face of white supremacy, the raw, ugly face of white violence, white on black violence, the murder of black people on television, on iPhones and iPads, the siding of police with vigilantes and murderers. God's people have had their spirits broken by the ugly truth of America, which I have been preaching for 53 years. Many of people have had their faith shattered by what they've seen. Some have almost given up hope. Now, they didn't want to hear what I was saying. Some of you did not want to hear what God's prophets were saying. They called me crazy. They killed Dr. King. They believed in the so-called American dream. Some thought that once we got somebody who looked like us in the White House, everything would be all right. Their faith has been shattered. Their spirits have been broken by the ugly truth and the reality of racism. Please understand, please, Donald Trump has not been saying anything new over the past four years. He's only saying out loud what a lot of white folks have been thinking quietly and behind closed doors. Trump is not doing anything that black folk didn't already know. He's just using his office to say out loud what a whole army of insects, a whole army of locusts, a whole swarm of flies have been thinking and saying and doing for over 400 years. Can you hear me now? Do you believe me now? No. Do you believe God now? God's people are broken and shattered, says the Lord, and these crooked clergy are not binding up their wounds. These crooked clergy are not providing a bomb in Gilead, the bomb that the Africans sang about, the bomb that makes the wounded whole. What are the crooked clergy doing? They are putting band-aids on the cancer of racism. They are putting band-aids on the cancer of white privilege. They are putting band-aids on the asinine behavior of the commander-in-chief who is a rapist, a misogynist, a sexist, a racist, who has no self-respect, much less respect for women. I believe his current wife was either a pole dancer or a stripper in a nightclub. Am I right about it? The so-called clergy who call themselves prophets and priests are putting band-aids on the cancer of reality that is metastasizing more rapidly than COVID-19. That is no cure. To cure cancer, you have to go in, go inside, go into the source of the problem, cut it out, and then use the radiation of God's love and the chemotherapy of the Holy Spirit to make sure it does not seep into the lymph nodes of the little ones who are coming behind the Proud Boys, the neo-Nazis, and the cult 45 Trumpites. Remember this, please. God's truth is on the ballot this Tuesday. 
Integrity is on the ballot this Tuesday. Honesty is on the ballot this Tuesday. No more lies is on the ballot this Tuesday. No more twisting words is on the ballot this Tuesday. No more Dr. Truth and contradicting Dr. Fauci. Those are the things that are on the ballot this Tuesday. That's what's at stake on Tuesday, November 3rd. Crooked clergy who are only interested in the dishonest dollar. Crooked clergy who are only interested in stimulus checks. Crooked clergy who are only after the money as they smile at you on Sunday with their bought and paid for pulpits. God bless you, my father's children. It's so good to be with you again. Remember, smiling faces sometimes tell lies. Just as the undisputed truth saying, beware of the evil that's behind the grin. Those crooked clergy are saying that they are against Black Lives Matter, like the president. Well, God says clearly, Black Lives Matter because I made them in my image. Now deal with that. Crooked clergy are saying, it's not so bad. One nervous Negro on Trump's payroll said that the Affordable Care Act, now you know it's used to stir up hatred for Barack to keep calling it Obamacare, it's the Affordable Care Act. This nervous Negro, who is a physician, y'all, a physician holding down a job on Trump's payroll for housing. This crooked clergy said that the Affordable Care Act was the worst thing that happened to this country since slavery. Somebody needs to slap him. He is a colored coon dancing to the tune of Massa. Somebody say to me, Reverend, you keep calling people coons. There's one black African-American talk show host who does not allow that language on his radio show or his television show. Well, I ain't him, I'm me. He is a colored coon dancing to the tune of Massa. They're saying, it's not so bad, you'll be just fine. God, however, says, things are not just fine. The murder of Breonna Taylor is not just fine. Ballistics told the forensic pathologist exactly which gun the bullets came out of that took that young, beautiful life. The other coon called Cameron holds down the job he has as Mitch McConnell's district attorney. He pressured the grand jury to side with the police in their investigation. That was bad enough, but to make bad matters worse, that coon did not even call Brianna's name when he read the findings of the investigation. Reckless endangerment of the wall next door was more important than the murder of a beautiful black woman. The drywall separating Brianna's apartment from the white person's apartment mattered more than Brianna's life mattered. God says, let me say it again, black lives matter. I am a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am saying along with God, black lives matter. The murder of Breonna Taylor is not just fine. Black lives matter. The murder of George Floyd is not just fine. Black lives matter. That's on the ballot Tuesday. 400 years of racist treatment of Africans is not just fine. 400 years of health care inequity is not just fine. 400 years of inequity in educational opportunities is not just fine. The rape of our women is not good. The disrespect of black women is not good. Reducing, reducing the temple of God to a WAP fiesta festival is not good. The inequity of criminal justice sentencing, trial, trial judges, district attorneys, racist judges being appointed, that is not just fine. The murder and mayhem in Nigeria is not just fine. For my sake, says God, 60 years of illegal occupation in Palestine by Zionist Israel is not just fine. 
the authorization of 5,000 new settlements in illegal territory in Palestine, where I sent my son, is not good. It is not just fine. Gaza, the largest open air prison on the planet, is not good. It is not just fine. The United States support of that racist apartheid regime in Zionist Israel is not good. It is not just fine. The murder of black boys by white cops is not good. It is not just fine. The murder of black boys by black boys is not good. Things are not just fine. Gangs are not good. Things are not just fine. Bloods and Crips are not good. Things are not just fine. Latin kings are not good. Things are not just fine. Gangster disciples are not good. Things are not just fine. Amos says, stop having church. Stop pretending to have church on the Lord's Day when you won't be the church the rest of the week. That BS is not good. I'm getting sick and tired of your saying it's good. It's almost over. When what is happening is y'all are going straight to hell in a handbasket, telling them lies to my people. Crooked clergy need to forget about the almighty dollar, the dishonest dollar, and come to the table with some ideas as to how to restore communal love, how to restore Ubuntu to my people how to pay reparations to my African people. The Temptations sang about you two generations ago playing at church, crooked, crooked clergy. You are crooked clergy, you are a bunch of rolling stones, stealing in the name of the Lord. Now three quick things about crooked clergy that this text says to me and that God speaks to. The first thing is this, crooked clergy always look out for number one. We took a glance at that during the first service. Crooked clergy always look out for number one. They have baptized capitalism in the name of the Lord and called the unending pursuit of dishonest dollars Christianity. I get so tired of hearing slick crooks telling their congregants to slap your neighbor a high five and tell your neighbor, I'm coming out. My breakthrough is right around the corner. The only Bentley on the parking lot belongs to the pastor. The only private jet at the airport belongs to the crooked clergy person. Ain't none of y'all got Bentley or Cessna jets. Male and female clergy, Paula White. Crooked clergy always look out for number one. They, not look, they do not look out for, nor care anything about God's people, the poor, and the have-nots. In case you do not know, sponsoring turkey drives at the Christmas drive or Thanksgiving time, or giving away useless toys at Christmas, most of which will be destroyed by New Year's Day, that is not showing Christian love. That's cheap charity and even cheaper grace. God's people need justice, not charity. Stop looking out for number one and start looking out to bring justice down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. That's the first thing this text teaches me. The second thing this text teaches me about crooked clergy both then and now is that crooked clergy lie to God's people. You're not only stealing in the name of the Lord, you're lying in the name of the Lord. Stop lying in the name of the Lord. Stop lying on a Sunday and tell God's people the truth. Hatred is real. Trump is hate. Hatred is real. But God is real too. White racism is choking the lives out of our little one. But God is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole, just as he was a bomb in Jeremiah's day, just as he provided a bomb in the days of chattel slavery, God is still providing a bomb today that makes the wounded whole. If you teach our children the truth, then they won't grow up thinking that white is right and that there is something wrong with them because their hair doesn't look like the white man's hair or their color is not the color of the imperial colonialists who conquered them and lie to them about the origin of civilization. Stop lying to God's people and start telling God's people the truth. 
Crooked clergy look out for number one. Crooked clergy lie to God's people. How does Peterson phrase God's word? Crooked clergy twist words. Twist words. That's another way of saying they're telling a lie. Crooked clergy doctor the truth. That is also a lie. A lie is a lie is a lie. You don't tell them half truth. You can't be half pregnant. If it's half truth, it's half a lie. If it's half a lie, it's a whole lie. A half truth is a lie. Your president is a lie. I told you, truth is on the ballot this Tuesday. Why am I not surprised at the thousands of lies Trump has told in three and a half years? That's easy. The word of God says it. The devil is a liar. Crooked clergy look out for number one. Crooked clergy lie to God's people. And crooked clergy love things and use people. When you love things and use people, instead of using things and loving people, you are no better than the racists who founded this country on the basis of slavery and denigrating people of Dr. Color. God didn't put this on my manuscript, but he put it on my mouth. I saw the president answer during the so-called debate that Black Lives Matter and his executive order prohibiting the teaching of diversity inclusion was because that teaching was saying this country was founded on hate. Trump, Trump, the country was founded on hate. The country was founded on genocide. The country was founded on slavery. That's hate, chattel slavery. The colonialists used Africans as things. They used Africans as mules for work and as sperm receptacles for play. The colonialists defined Africans as things, as hate. When you're not a person, you are a thing. When you're not a person, you are not a subject. That means you're an object, either a work object or a sex object. That is how Africans were defined in the Constitution. The country was founded on hate, and that is what you are imitating when you use people as things. Loving things and using people says to me that you have forgotten the greatest gift of all, which is God's love for you and God's love for me. One of the most helpful lessons I learned in the early years of my pastorate is a lesson my father taught me when I was complaining to Daddy about how I was being treated by some of my members who did not like gospel music. In my sermon titled Unexpected Blessing, you can find that in the book, What Makes You So Strong. In that sermon, Unexpected Blessing, I talked about that passage of scripture in the second chapter of Mark where the devil came to church. Many of you have experienced how the devil comes to church. I pointed out in that message that the devil has no other way of getting to church other than coming with you. Riding in your car, getting on the bus with you, sometimes sitting right beside you in the sanctuary. And on some Sundays, the devil doesn't stop in the pews in the sanctuary. The devil comes right on up in the pulpit. These devils, back then I was telling my daddy were against anything and everything I was trying to do for God's people. When I wanted an African-centered school to teach African-American children their history and their heritage, the devils tried to block it because they didn't like gospel music. Does that make sense to you? Does anything the devil does make sense to you? Just think about your president for a moment before you answer that question. I was complaining to my father about the devils. And he said the strangest thing to me. He said, son, 
Patrick said, buddy, you can't stop loving them. I asked him why in the hell I couldn't stop loving them, all the hell they were giving me. And my father said, because God ain't never stopped loving you. He then said to me, think of all the things you've done in your life that hurt the heart of God. Think of the worst thing you've done in your life. God didn't give up on you, so you can't give up on them. To prove God's love for you, God gave God's only begotten Son. God's Son gave His life. There is no greater love than the love God has for you. It is a love that is not like the love of human beings. It is not sun-timey. It is not wishy-washy. It is not on and off of loving one minute that can't stand you the next. It is constant. It is changeless. It is limitless. There is no expiration date on the love that God has for you. There is no greater love, no greater love than God's love for you. Let us pray. Thank you for a love so great that words cannot define it. Thank you for a love that makes my heart sing, oh how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he do? Thank you for a love that wakes me up in the morning and reminds me each day that black lives matter. Help me to take that love with me into the voting booth on November 3rd. And the people of God Together we'll say our say and amen. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peace for sure, very deeply stained within. Sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now say, Am I love lifted me? Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love. What a powerful word we just heard from our pastor emeritus, Reverend Dr. Jeremiah A. Wright Jr. We thank and praise God for that mighty word, Dr. Wright. We are all the better because of that word that you just provided. And it is our prayer that you will be restored 10,000 fold 
for the amazing way that you just poured that awesome word into our lives on today. God bless you, and may God ever smile upon you. And God's people, we've come to that point in our service that we offer Christ to all those who are interested in becoming a part of this branch of Zion, Trinity United Church of Christ, the church that we believe is the greatest church on this side of the Jordan. If you are interested in becoming a part of this village, we invite you right now to email that email that you see on the screen or call the church right now and we will pray for you and we will get you signed up for our next member uh, class, our next new member class so that you can be a part of this congregation. We would love to have you as a part. So email us right now or call us right now and we offer Christ to you. We pray God's people that you will have a wonderful week this week. We pray that God blesses you real good, that you will experience the joy and the peace of Christ as you move throughout this week. Make sure if you have not voted that you get out and vote um, by Tuesday uh, so that we can impact change in this world. And now we say, may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. Make God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto each one of you until we meet again. Go in peace and have a wonderful week. God bless you and amen. Let me tell you a story, a story about my father, Otis Moss Sr. It's the story of my father's determination to exercise his right to vote. One morning in the fall of 1946, he got up, determined to cast his ballot. My father was a farmer, a sharecropper in the rural South. He served in the military during the First World War. Always a man of dignity quiet courage and determination. Our mother, his devoted wife, had died at an early age, and my father struggled as a single parent of five children. I'm going to vote today. We were amazed, excited, that our father is about to do something really significant. Go vote, Bunga! Vote him out! Yeah, go get him! We love you! Go get him! He walked from the house well-dressed, well-groomed, six miles to the town center. Now, in every age, things have been introduced to keep certain people from voting, especially black people. We knew the racism, the hatred, the injustice represented 
in Governor Eugene Talmadge. And some of the Negroes will vote. If I'm your governor, they won't vote in our white party the next four years. He was well aware of all of the dangers, toils, snares, and roadblocks to keep him from voting. But he was willing to face all of that and exercise his right to vote. He did not know what the experience would be for him on that day, but he was well aware of what was taking place all over the South at that very moment. Sir, I am Otis Moss, and I am here to vote. What did you say your name was? Otis Moss. Otis, it looks like you've come to the wrong polling place. You need to go over to the Mountville School. I have a letter here from the county stating that I vote here. People from your side of town ought to vote in Mountville. You're supposed to get a letter, but the mail's been slow this past few weeks. Now, did he come over this evening? I think he came here a little earlier. May I have my letter back? Let me tell you a story about my grandfather. He'd already walked six miles to the first polling place. Now he's being told, you've come to the wrong place. A clear and blatant lie. Now he has to go to the Montville School. And the Montville School is in a different city. I imagine as my grandfather walked, the sounds of the world crept into his ear. You are a second class citizen. You are three-fifths of a person. You are nothing but a Negro. But in his spirit, he heard his faith and the song say, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Not just walking, but marching to the next polling place. He steps through the doors of the Montville School, unsure of what he will face. Yes? I'm here to vote. I was sent here from the LaGrange Courthouse. You are in the wrong place. You're supposed to vote at the Rosemont School. Now, the clerk from the courthouse said I was to come here. I don't know about that, but I know you're supposed to vote at the Rosemont School. Ma'am. Let me tell you the story of my great-grandfather. Because of the color of his skin, he was held back from voting. Voting, a basic right of his, one of his freedoms. And because of the way he looked, he wasn't allowed to. Despite the next polling place being six more miles, despite the disappointment and the anger and the frustration, his determination, strong will, and dream to vote outweighed any disappointment that crossed his mind. Boy, I sure am sorry, but the polling place closed. Now, if you would have been here five minutes earlier, we would have let you in. Thank you. 
wounded, but never give up. Denied, but never accepting that denial. Insulted, but refusing to accept the insult inwardly and thereby setting an example and a memory for generations unborn. Just a few years after that, our father was killed in an automobile accident. Fast forward, I became a participant in the civil rights movement and the voting rights movement and joined Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the Selma March, witnessed the signing of the voting rights bill, 1965. That was a great moment. It was a great victory. In the civil rights struggle, it was a great accomplishment. However, no one could dig up our father's bones and put a ballot in his hand. Some things are beyond the repair. Papa, a minute. Next time. Next time. Listen here. Promise me. If you get a chance, you got a vote. One of the remarkable moments in my life and in my memory is taking my son, Otis III, to vote. I paused on my side of the curtain in prayerful silence and listened to Otis III punch his ballot. That became music, freedom music, liberation music, the sound of my father's footsteps trying to cast his vote.
On behalf of Trinity United Church of Christ and its senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III, thank you to everyone for voting the dream.